For folks who are just joining us right now, we're going to get started in about a minute or so. We're just waiting for others to be able to log on. So hang tight. Good evening and welcome to our third Rewilding Planet Earth event of this semester with Dr. Nalini Ned Carney presenting Tapestry Thinking, Weaving Diverse Human Perspectives with Nature. My name is Tara pisani Garo. I'm the director of the Boston College's Environmental Studies Program. And I've been working with faculty from across the campus to bring you this year's Rewilding Planet Earth series, which is supported by a grant from the Institute for Liberal Arts. Rewilding Planet Earth invites us to take seriously the biodiversity extinction crisis, to think critically about our relationship with nature and to participate in the UN Decade for Ecosystem Restoration. The series emphasizes both the need to be as informed as possible and to stay engaged through shared action, community involvement, and a commitment to the common good. The next event, will be on April 19th at 7 p.m. with Paul Hawken, speaking about his latest book, Regeneration, Ending the Climate Crisis in One Generation. The format for this evening's event is a 40 to 45 minute presentation followed by 30 minutes of Q&A. You can submit your questions using the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen, and we'll do our very best to get to as many as possible. And now I'd like to introduce you to our speaker this evening. Known as the queen of the forest canopy, Nalini Ned Carney has explored the rainforest tree canopies around the world for four decades. She was featured in the National Geographic 1998 documentary, Heroes of the High Frontier, for her pioneering research on epiphytes and aerial nutrient cycling. Nalini weaves together her science, art, and unique communication style to engage the public in nature and biodiversity conservation and science. She's created long-term collaborations with faith organizations, artists, rap singers, corporations like Mattel, and people who are incarcerated to inspire restoration of all ecosystems at local, regional, and global scales. She has over 130 publications in top journals like Science, Biotropica, Ecology, Ecologia, Journal of Tropical Ecology, and Conservation Biology. Now, in addition to her ecology research, in recent years, Ned Carney has engaged with social, pedagogical, and theological questions. For an example, in 2020, she published a paper in the journal Currents in Theology and Mission entitled Faith and Science as Partners in Environmental Awareness and Creation Care, an Ecologist View. She is the author of the book Between Earth and Sky, Our Intimate Connections to Trees, and has delivered TED Talks on conserving the canopy and life science in prison. Not too surprising, with such cross-disciplinary research and innovative public engagement, Nalini Ned Carney is a recipient of a number of titles and awards, including the Distinguished Professor of Innovation and Impact at the University of Utah, and the Union of Concerned Scientists Inspiring Scientist Award, to name just a couple. She lives in Utah with her husband, John Longino, an entomologist, and she has two children and just recently became a grandmother. So Nalini Ned Carney, welcome to Boston College. It's such a pleasure to have you join us this evening and to be part of our Rewilding Planet Earth series. 
I'm going to turn off my my video and my microphone and pass it off to you. Great, thank you so much, Tara. I'm really glad for this opportunity to present in your rewilding series. Um, I believe that many of my ideas really align perfectly with what your series is about um, and to engage with nature through shared action. And I think this is such an important topic for all of us, uh, whether you live near the wetlands in Ma Massachusetts or where, where you are, or the tropical rainforests uh, where I've carried out research for almost 40 years now. And I think those of us who think about nature, those of us who study nature, those of us who are trying to work towards conservation often feel that we're sort of walking a knife ridge between hope and despair about our capacity to carry out conservation in the current situations that we find planet Earth. I believe that if we fall too far on the, on the side of hope, we continue with the status quo. But if we lean too much on the side of despair, then we risk immobilization by feeling too powerless. And so I've been inspired by this very short poem by an Indian poet named Rabindranath Tagore. He wrote, the tapestry of life's story is woven with the threads of life's ties, ever breaking and joining. I think it's beautiful because it relates so much to forests themselves, because I see forests themselves as tapestries, as interweavings of species and interactions. But it also tells me that I must weave together seemingly disparate elements of society and ways of knowing to create potentially new ways of stewardship of nature. And, and to do so in ways that mimic real tapestries, things that are complex, that are connected, that are strong, that are useful, and that are beautiful. And so what I'd like to do this evening with you in this part of this rewilding series is to break up my talk into three areas. First, I'd like to share with you some of the results that my students and colleagues and I have garnered over the last 35 years of forest canopy ecology work. Secondly, I'd like to describe some of the ways that I've uh, tried to connect nature and people. And third, I'd like to discuss some of the transformative actions that I have taken and perhaps you have thought about or taken yourselves in terms of conservation and rewilding our planet. But before I start off on those, I'd like to just share a little bit about my own personal background, which I would love to share with you in person if I had been able to get there. Um, my parents come from disparate backgrounds themselves. My father was a Hindu. He grew up in India uh, and he studied pharmacology. My mother was uh, from Brooklyn, New York of Russian parentage and she was raised as an Orthodox Jew. Um, so they came together and wove their stories together. Uh, they had five children. I was the third daughter. And for me, climbing trees as a kid, uh, the eight maple trees that lined our driveways was a very important thing for me. It was sort of my place that was my own, my refuge. It was a place where I felt safe, where I felt fun, where I could ask questions about the squirrels that were running around and the leaves of the trees as they turned colors. And I took a little oath when I was eight or nine years old where I've said to myself, I really wanna do something when I'm a grown up that will help protect trees because they protected me as a little kid. And I didn't really have any idea of how to do it. I thought maybe I'll be a firefighter or a forest ranger, but it was in college that I learned about the field of ecology, the study of plants and animals and their interactions with the environment. And as a graduate student, I decided to study the forest canopy, which was very poorly explored at that time. In fact, it was called the last biotic frontier. Now that is a promise, isn't it? That's what scientists are supposed to do. They're supposed to explore new frontiers. And so um, I, there were very few people who were studying the forest canopy at that time. People were beginning to pioneer techniques that involved rope climbing and mountain climbing. And since then we have developed other techniques um, to get into the forest canopy, construction cranes, hot air balloons, uh, canopy walkways and drones are even being used to study the canopy. But at that time, the, really the only way to get up there was to, to treat trees as if they were mountains and to get ropes up into trees and climb them with standard mountain climbing techniques. And I would love to bring each of you up to the forest canopy to see what that environment is and to see the plants and animals and that tapestry of the forest canopy. But I can't do that, so I'll do the next best thing, which is to share a little bit of video that was created by the National Geographic Society that I think documents the way that we get into forest trees using these techniques. This was taken in the tropical cloud forest of Monteverde, Costa Rica, where I've been working and carrying out research for the last 35 years. And that's me in the year 2000, climbing a giant strangler thing that I still climb to this day.
so that's how we get up into trees. And you know, I'm, I'm sure that many of us would love to be part of that, uh, that part of that exercise. But if you were to come up with me to the canopy, I think you would sense immediately that the micro environment of the canopy is very different from what you encounter on the dark, damp forest floor. There's much more sunlight. There are greater extremes of relative humidity and of temperature. Uh, there's a lot of wind that comes in the upper canopy. So it's quite a different micro environment. And for that reason, as well as the architecture of the branches themselves, um, there have been there are a tremendous diversity of animals and plants that have adapted themselves to and evolved to accommodate life in the forest canopy. Many species of mammals, of birds, of reptiles, of insects and amphibians that spend all or part of their life cycle up in the forest canopy in tropical and temperate rainforests. And animals are very interesting, but I found the plants, the canopy dwelling plants, the most interesting. These are called epiphytes. Epi means upon, phyte means plant. So they're plants that grow upon other plants, trees that is, and they derive their nutrients not by putting their roots into the branches or to the forest floor, but rather garnering their nutrients from atmospheric sources, from nutrients that are dissolved in rain and mist and cloud. They're very diverse. Um, they're very uh, adap adapted to their canopy environment, but I myself was interested not only in their taxonomy or their physiology, but also what roles they might play in terms of ecosystem function. How do they actually function within the forest? How do they interact with the rest of the forest as a whole? And over the last decades, my students and I have learned that these epiphytes, these canopy dwelling plants are extremely efficient at intercepting and holding on to these nutrients that come in the form of rain and mist and fog. Those nutrients dwell and reside in the epiphytes themselves and their accompanying ca canopy soils, but eventually they fall to the forest floor, either by just sliding off the branch in what we call epi slides, or actually whole branches and trees fall to the forest floor, and these epiphytes then ride them down, thus enriching the nutrient cycles of the forest as a whole. Another aspect of the importance of these canopy plants is that they play keystone, they are sort of, they play keystone roles in terms of the arboreal birds and mammals that encounter them. We did a study where we looked at the um, use of, of epiphytic plants in contrast to the host tree resources, the flowers, the fruits, the nectar, and the invertebrates that are nestled in that canopy soil. And we found that over a third of all of the foraging visits to these trees were to the epiphyte resources, not to the host trees. We also know from other studies that, that these canopy plants represent nesting sites for many endangered species, such as the marbled murrelet in the Pacific Northwest there on the right. Well, just to sort of collapse canopy studies into like a very short period of time, nearly all of the canopy research that's been done has occurred in primary rainforests. That is rainforests that haven't been cut down or otherwise negatively affected by human activities. But as you are all aware, more and more of tropical and temperate rainforests are being affected by human activities like deforestation, forest fragmentation, the replacement of forests for agricultural use, invasive species, and of course, climate change, the isolation of particular trees as a particular interest, but on a broader scale, the changes that are going on in the environment at the large scale, that is the increase in the length of dry seasons and tropical cloud forests, for example, is very worrisome, is very much pushing us over to the side of despair rather than hope. And my colleagues and I are now looking at our most recent research project concerns trying to document the effects of climate change on canopy dwelling plants in our long-term study sites in Costa Rica. Um, what we're learning is that um, these plants, although they're very resilient in some ways, may not be able to, to live through the increasing length of dry seasons and the reduction of mist and cloud that's, that's occurring as a result of climate change and global warming. This is all going on, of course, at the same time that there's not only things going on with negative things going on in terms of the environment in the tropics, but also in terms of the current increasing distance between nature and humans, especially in urban areas. And this I think is really what keeps me on that knife edge of despair and hope as I think about more and more people in urban areas of the world 
being further and further from nature, being unconnected, being disconnected, not being able to have contact with nature that is so important to our physical health and our mental and emotional well being. And so I, as a research scientist, really have to ask myself, well, what am I doing in terms of not just understanding, but actually taking action about such environmental pressures as climate change and deforestation, invasive species, and simply not knowing what's going on in nature because of this growing separation. And so I, as a scientist, really had to ask myself, um, what should I be doing? And I remember one particular day when I was up in a tall fig tree, a, a tree I've named Figarola, and I heard a chainsaw just outside, just outside the border of the Monteverde Cloud Forest Reserve where I do my research. And I thought, my gosh, if I'm hearing a chainsaw just outside of the reserve here, then surely I must have to do something, not just as a scientist. I mean, of course I contribute to, to something in the way of, of, of conservation by increasing the knowledge base <clears throat> of forest ecology. But I felt that I had to do something beyond that, beyond simply writing my little papers that other scientists might read or reporting my results at a scientific conference. And I began thinking that perhaps I could use public engagement as a way of raising awareness of the importance of trees with the general public. So in 1996, I started a nonprofit called the International Canopy Network or ICANN. And its members were canopy researchers, but our audiences were educators and conservationists and arborists and people concerned with, with forest ecology. Well, we began writing articles for nature, natural history magazines and kids magazines. We collaborated with National Geographic to make videos and documentaries. But I pretty soon realized that the only people who watch those nature documentaries or pick up a natural history magazine or visit a forest or visit a museum are those people who are already convinced that forests are wonderful places to visit, wonderful places to protect. And so I began thinking about ways that I might extend my public engagement beyond the choir, so to speak. And I began thinking about little girls and how important it is for little girls to be concerned and be connected to nature. And I remembered that as a little girl myself, you know, as an eight or nine year old, I got my connection to nature and my desire to protect it by climbing trees in my parents' front yard. But I also recognized that little girls in Tokyo or New York City or Nairobi might not have the opportunity that I did as a little girl to climb trees and feel connected to nature. So I had to think about alternative ways that I might do this. And I began thinking, well, what is it that little girls value? And I realized that, um, <laughs> that Barbie is something that almost every little girl values. Even my own six-year-old daughter, uh, Ricky, came up to me when she was six or seven and said, mom, can I have a Barbie? And I thought, oh no, how have I failed? But you know, Barbie's um, sort of brand and Mattel's brand of Barbie really celebrates a certain image. And, and what I thought is maybe we could disturb that image. Maybe we could shift that image in order to incorporate this idea that a woman could have a career climbing trees and find satisfaction and fulfillment in studying the forest canopy. So I thought maybe Treetop Barbie would be a really great solution. I approached Mattel. I talked to people there and they, for some reason, they were not interested in, in, you know, in taking on a Treetop Barbie. And so we decided, my students and I decided to do it anyway. And so we started buying used Barbies from Goodwill stores. We engaged volunteer seamstresses to make little field clothes and outfits. Uh, we went to eBay and got little helmets for Barbie. And most importantly, we, we made a little booklet about forest canopy organisms. And this went along with Treetop Barbie. For a number of years, we've been selling Treetop Barbie on my website. I mean, it's an academic website, so it doesn't get a lot of traffic. But what, what's been really interesting um, is two years ago, I got a phone call from National Geographic, and it turns out that they have partnered with Mattel to make a series of what they call Explorer Barbies. That is women scientists, a polar explorer, a wildlife ecologist, an astrophysicist, and a, and a wildlife photographer in the body of, of um, Barbie. And uh, they called me and they said, Nalini, you sort of started this out. Would you be an advisor for us in terms of making sure we get the accessories right? Of course, I was delighted to do this. And, and thanks for my advisory role. They made a one-of-a-kind Nalini look-alike 
treetop Barbie. And I'm, I'm very proud to have that. And I think, although, you know, it was kind of cool to see this evolution of a corporation, I don't really think it was the idea of treetop Barbie itself or my own pushing this idea. I think what's significant about this interaction is that Mattel must have done a lot of marketing work and learned that there's actually a market among young girls and their moms or their dads or their aunts and uncles that actually want to have a Barbie that shows evidence that little girls are looking towards models of women who have careers of exploring, of discovering, of exploring that canopy or, or exploring that tapestry of the weaving together of science and society. So I think that things have changed to accommodate this new model that we might aspire to. Well, that kind of led to a whole series of projects that I'd like to describe. I'd like to describe some of that to you. And that involves a second section of my talk, which is about connecting nature and people. And the idea that I had really following this adventure with Treetop Barbie was I thought maybe what I could sort of cogitate about or have a, as a conceptual model this idea of tapestry, of weaving together different values. Now, I've documented the ecological values of trees and forests, which I represent here by these vertical red lines. And I thought, oh, well, we can have a recreational value that is a little girl playing with, with treetop Barbie as another thread that is the, the horizontal thread that you see here that represents the recreational values of trees connecting with the ecological values of trees and forests. And so what I'd like to talk about during the second part of my talk are some of the ways that my students and colleagues and I have tried to weave together not only the recreational values of trees, but also the spiritual values, the aesthetic values, and some of the social justice values that might be woven together to create a tapestry of care and of concern and of action to preserve forests and by extension nature. So let's take a look at spiritual values and how we might weave together the spiritual values of trees and forests with the ecological values of trees and forests. So spiritual values, well, as I mentioned earlier, you know, my upbringing was kind of this sort of funny mixture of Hinduism and, and Orthodox Judaism. And we also went to a Unitarian Sunday school for, for a while when we were little kids. And even I, though I'm not raised as a Christian, have come to understand that Trees can be extremely important spiritual values. In fact, when you open the first page of the Old Testament, you find a description of two important trees, the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And so I decided that maybe an approach I could take that would avoid confronting religious people uh, with science and with the value, the scientific or ecological values of trees was to draw upon the authorities of the world religions themselves by looking through their holy scriptures and seeing how they describe trees and forests. And so I began to uh, think about ways <clears throat> that I could pull together these pieces of information, these data points, so to speak, from the holy scriptures of world religions. So I downloaded these scriptures from the web and I did a search for the words tree and forest. And for example, in the, in the Old Testament, I found that there were 328 references to the words tree and forest. And being a scientist, of course, I had to classify and categorize them. And here's the, uh, just a graph of the percentages of these verses that relate to symbolic and aesthetic use of trees, analogies to life and God, practical use, uh, trees used as, as location descriptors, um, verses that describe tree loss as bad. And there were even a few verses about tree biology. I also decided to look at the celebrations and the rituals and the holidays that different religious people celebrate. So for example, that, that concern trees. So for example, in the Jewish religion, there's a wonderful holiday called Tub Shavat, which celebrates the new year for the trees. And they have a special ceremonial dinner or Seder that features nuts and fruits that are provided by trees to people. Buddha, of course, was became enlightened when he sat underneath the bode tree. In the Book of Mormon, and I'm in Utah, so I there are many people of the faith of the of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. There's a description of a tree with white fruits, and there's a rod or a path that goes to this to this tree, which represents the love of God for his followers. 
And finally, in the Islam religion, one thing that is really intriguing to me is that people of this faith are always looking for the word Allah, and that is written in the Arabic script. And they look at branches of trees and they see the shape of these branches actually is configured into the word Allah. And so they find that which is sacred to them in the branches and the crowns of trees. Well, I took all of this information, the data from the, the Holy Scriptures and from these religious celebrations, and I put together a sermon called Trees and Spirituality. And I offered this in churches and synagogues and temples. And as I said, there was never a conflict between science and religion when I gave these talks, creationism versus evolution, because I was drawing upon the scriptures of that particular group and of world religions in general. And so there was wonderful sets of interactions that happened as I, as a scientist, took the pulpit or the bima and talked about what I had learned about religion, spirituality, and trees and shared that with congregants. We took this a step further. Um, my students and I decided that, you know, churches are sacred and most people think the sacred part of church is on, is on the inside of the church. But I also figure that churchyards protect sacred ground. So that soil that's in churchyards is sacred ground. And I thought, well, if there are trees growing in the sacred ground, the soil, the sacred soil of the sacred ground of churchyards, then those trees must have some aspect of, of the sacred as well. And so we created these little book booklets um, that have information from the scriptures and also biological information about each species of tree that we encountered in these churchyards. We created these booklets, which we gave out to congregants so that they could share in the knowledge, both the religious knowledge as well as the scientific knowledge of the trees that grow on the ground that they, that they protect. And also I asked them to think about, well, if there's a tree growing right outside the sacred ground of your churchyard, might that tree also have something sacred about it? And what about the trees on the hillsides that surround our city? Perhaps those trees might share something of the sacred as well. All of these activities have led me to also give lectures in seminaries, to run tree plantings and bio blitzes on, on tree on, on church grounds. And it actually last year led to a conversation that I had with the, um, the Archbishop of Canterbury, who is the spiritual leader of 85 million Episcopalians and Anglicans. And he was interested in the topic of ecological justice. And so I was able to have a conversation with this very powerful religious leader about the importance of thinking about ecological justice and what role that might play in religious thinking of someone like him and all of his followers. So those are some of the things that we have created, that we have carried out, that we've implemented and in some cases evaluated in terms of the impacts that we might have in weaving together the ecological values of trees and forests with the spiritual values of trees and forests. Well, what about aesthetic values? Well, it's dead easy to think about the aesthetic values of trees and forests. For centuries, people have artists and musicians and poets and creative writers have taken inspiration from trees and forests to create artwork that they share with others. And so I decided to look into this uh, in, a, in a kind of an organized way by creating what I call canopy confluences. And in these confluences, I pull together for a week at a time, um, e ecologists, but also visual artists and poets, opera singers, uh, rap singers, modern dancers. And we spend a week in the forest. I teach them all how to climb trees to get up into the forest canopy. And they then carry out their own perceptions, their aesthetic perceptions of what they encounter up in the forest canopy. And then they communicate that to art audiences. So here, for example, is a piece of art that was made by Bruce Chow, who's at the Rhode Island School of Design, who spent time with us on a canopy confluence. He went back to Rhode Island and he created this piece of installation art that to him represented both the strength and the fragility of the forest canopy. We brought musicians into the forest canopy on these confluences, a wooden flute player, a guitarist, a classical oboist, and also a rap singer, one of my students named Duke Brady. And Duke Brady's rap songs about being in the canopy were like so compelling and so attractive to kids that I would give talks to in primary and secondary schools that I decided to start a little, progr a little program called Sound Science. 
in which we brought together at-risk kids from Tacoma, Washington. I engaged a professional rap singer named Caution. We went out into the forest on our campus with a biologist and with Caution and these 40 kids. We spent the morning out there and then in the afternoon, we'd go into the sound studios at our college and the kids would make up their own rap songs about their experience, their interaction, their engagement with the forest on our campus. They made their own songs. We ended up making a recording of these songs that they were able to take home to share with their family and friends. So trying to use the things that they valued in terms of rap music, uh, rather than the kinds of music that I, I like, um, but it seemed to have meaning for them in terms of linking them to nature and valuing it. So those are the kinds of things that we've done to try to weave together the aesthetic with the ecological values. Uh, the, the fourth area of sort of societal values I'd like to talk about concerns social justice. And this has brought me to work with people who are incarcerated. There are about 2.3 million people in the United States who are now incarcerated. About 50,000 youth are now incarcerated as well. And prisons and state prisons, federal prisons, um, city jails, county jails, tribal jails, and juvenile detention centers are probably the most nature deprived environments in which you can live or work or gather. And it seemed to me if there was any population in our country that needed contact with nature, it, it is those people who are incarcerated. And so in 2004, I started a program in Washington state where I lived at the time to bring science lectures and scientists and conservation projects to people who are incarcerated in state prisons. This was very well received. The men were extremely interested in these science lectures. And that led me to have start collaborations and partnerships with ongoing conservation projects to include the participation of people who are incarcerated to contribute to rearing endangered species, endangered plants, um, and that would then be later released to protected areas outside of the prison. So the first project that we worked on involved a captive rearing of the Oregon spotted frog, which is a state sensitive species. Its population has shrunk to just two little areas in Southwestern Washington. The Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife has collected eggs from those population and those populations and has developed protocols to rear those frogs from egg to tadpole to adult and then release them to protected wetlands. And so conservationists came into the Cedar Creek Correctional Center, a minimum security men's prison in Washington state and taught them how to rear these frogs. The men were incredibly good at this. They were devoted to this. They knew every single frog by name. Um, they were extremely concerned when any of their frogs died. They asked us for pieces of wood so they could make little grave markers for the frogs that had died. Um, but they were very engaged not only with the, the process, the day-to-day -day process, they were also really, I think, um, interested in the fact that they were able to make a contribution to something that was bigger than themselves, bigger than the prison, something as big as, in real, reality, as big as planet Earth, because they were contributing to the preservation of biodiversity by, by creating these small creatures and being able to release them then into protected areas. We have since then developed collaborations with other conservation groups. For example, the Nature Conservancy has helped us help um, inmates in the Stafford Creek Correctional Center rear 300,000 plugs of endangered prairie plants each year for outplanting in protected prairie areas. We engaged women at the Women's Correctional Center in Washington to raise the Taylor Checker Spot butterfly, which is a federally listed species from egg to caterpillar to adult butterfly, which were then again released in protected prairies. When I moved to the state of Utah in 2011, I started a similar program with Draper State Prison, the Salt Lake County Jail, and five juvenile detention centers here in Salt Lake Valley. And one of the conservation projects that we've been working on is having the men build kestrel or build nesting boxes for the American kestrel, which is an amazing bird of prey that's actually declining in population all across North America. 
So all of these projects then have been really instrumental in terms of not only creating these plants and animals that are so badly needed for ecological restoration, but also providing an avenue by which people who are incarcerated, people who live in these nature deprived habitats, people who really have no ability to carry out conservation in the traditional sense, those folks can also contribute if we provide them with the opportunity, the tools, the encouragement, and the know-how, and the confidence that they can work with these sensitive species and carry out conservation in a way that augments and enhances the efforts of conservation and ecological restoration on the outside. Well, I was really happy with all of these projects, but after six or seven years of working with the correctional systems and the whole system of mass incarceration, as I began doing these projects, I realized that I was, I was, not, I was not getting to the people who are incarcerated who are the furthest away from nature. And that is those men and women who are confined in solitary confinement cell blocks. In solitary confinement, uh, men and women who are placed in there for violent interactions, either the crimes that they committed or their behaviors while they're incarcerated, end up in these tiny nine by 12 foot cells for 23 hours a day. There's absolutely no access to nature here. One hour a day, they are shackled and taken to an exercise room where they can walk around, they can do pull-ups, they're shackled again and put back in their solitary confinement cell blocks. Now, we're not, we didn't have the capacity to bring scientific lectures or scientists or soil or seeds or frogs or butterflies or bird nest boxes to, these, to this population that is confined in what they call secured housing or solitary confinement. But we know from other studies, for example, studies that have been carried out in hospitals, which are, by the way, another nature deprived habitat, that patients who can look out a window and see, and see trees, we know that people who can look at nature or can look even at nature imagery when they're hospitalized actually recover faster. They spend fewer days in the hospital. They use fewer narcotic drugs. There are fewer nurse complaints. And, and, they, um, and, they're, and so they, it seems then, and it's been documented by psychologists then, that the presence of nature or being able to view or hear nature can have an extremely positive effect on physical recovery, as well as on bringing down stress and anxiety, aggression and violence. Well, if that's the case, and there are hundreds of studies that have documented this, it seemed to me that that might be a technique by which we could bring nature imagery to people in solitary confinement. So I was able to get access to a supermax prison in 2014 that provided us access to a cell block that was composed of two parts. On one side, we were able to show nature videos. On the other side, we did not show nature videos. After a year, we came back and after seeing nature videos for just one hour a day during their exercise time, we found that the men who watched nature videos committed 26% fewer violent infractions, which is actually of value to the officers and to the administrators, as well as the inmates um, of that prison. There were additional benefits to those scientists who entered into the prison. They became better communicators, better teachers of of students of diverse learning. And there was a sense of meaning that my, my research has more meaning when I can share it with people who would not otherwise get access to it. And although we who have been working on these projects understand that you know, giving some research lectures or providing access to conservation does not in and of itself solve the deep seated injustices that are rampant in our system of mass incarceration, we do believe that what we are able to do by bringing academic scientists and conservation work inside prisons and jails and juvenile detention centers improves the lives, improves the emotions, and, and provides an opportunity to contribute in a world where contribution is simply not possible. So I'd like to sort of provide my third piece of, of my talk about 
transformative actions by thinking about this tapestry, this interweaving of values, um, and what we might think about it in terms of how how others might contribute to this to weaving this tapestry and making it more strong, more useful, and more beautiful. And I think what I've learned from all of these projects is that it's really important for scientists to have what I call humility for others' perspectives through engagement. That is to put aside for the moment some of my own ecological values so I might be able to incorporate values of others. I think it's also important to ask who is weaving, who is sitting at the loom when we create this tapestry of care for the environment. And I think I've shown you in some cases at least that Barbie is a weaver at the loom. I think it, um, inmates can be weavers, churches can be a part of that, a rap singer like Caution can contribute. And I'd also like to say that young people are very important uh, uh, for this. And I put a picture here of my nephew whose name is Zach Tribbestone. He lives in Charlottesville, Virginia, and he's going to be a freshman at Boston College this coming fall. He's very, very eager and very interested and, and excited about joining uh, the student body at Boston College. And I'm really curious to see how Zach is going to fit into this loom because of his strong, his deep, his devoted interest in nature. So I am hoping that he will find a place at the loom of Boston College where he can contribute to weaving this tapestry of care for nature and the environment. Another thing I would say in terms of transformative actions is that although I've been talking about large scale efforts like our prison project or talking to the Archbishop of, of Canterbury, that small actions are really critical as well. So one example of a small action that I took just kind of as a fluke was even though I don't really like uh, painting my fingernails, it's not something I do. Many people are really interested in painted fingernails. And so I went into a manicurist and I said, could you please paint trees? on green nail polish. Um, and so for two or three weeks after that, before the nail polish all sort of, you know, clicked off, um, I was able to just sort of notice that whenever I went up to a young woman, for example, who had painted fingernails and I would show her mine, we would start this great conversation about my interest in trees and her experience with trees and what were her fingernails like. So even such a small act, an, an inexpensive, inexpensive act, and an act that takes just an hour of your time can promote valuable conversations about the importance of trees and nature with people that you might not otherwise have that conversation with. I think another thing to think about with small actions is that they might lead to big actions. And because I'm so old, you know, and I've had such a long time to work on these projects, I can see that small actions like that first little Barbie I made actually developed into this Explorer Barbie that's made by the Mattel Corporation. My single little sermons resulted in a conversation with a very powerful spiritual leader. My single lectures starting out at one little tiny prison has evolved into conservation work at over 60 prisons across the country. So I think that even though actions seem small, if we persist with them, they have the possibility of turning into something larger. The other thing we can think about with small actions is their collective power. I carried out this calculation. I know that there are 325 million people in the United States. There are 6.2 million scientists and environmentalists. So that if each person, each scientist, each environmentalist talks to just 52 people a year, that's just one person a week, we will have collectively had conversations with every single person in the United States. And I think that can be a powerful way to counteract despair with hope. And so as we together walk along this knife ridge, as you students and faculty at Boston College who are making this tremendous effort to inform yourselves about rewilding the earth and hear me in Utah and in Costa Rica and Washington state making my small but I think significant efforts to combat the despair and shift it to hope. I think it's a very hopeful time. And I'm really interested in thinking about what might be the things that you have to say that you're planning to do in order to shift this work from the immobile, seemingly unmovable uh, bulk of problems of, that concern the environment to ways that we can think 
of reaching that canopy and of weaving a tapestry of care for our environment, our forests and ourselves. Thank you very much. Wow, uh, Nalini, that was such an incredible talk. Thank you so much. You, you were able to cover so many different topics. I loved it. I wanna encourage people who are on our webinar still to please submit your questions and I'll, I'll ask them as they come in. I wanna start with a question of curiosity <laughs> around how you went about to gain access to um, high security prisons and what, what do those conversations look like? What's that process of getting a prison or a juvenile detention facility to want to work with you and have inmates work on American Kestrel nesting boxes or have, you know, working in the, I know there was one project working on, on growing moss. Um, how did you convince people of the value of this work and then get resources to do that? Was that through grants? I'd just love to hear a little bit more, especially since that work has seemed to grow over the years. Right. Um, well, I started out very small, very small. Um, you know, I had, had no experience with people who were incarcerated. I didn't know that societal sector at all. All I knew was that people who are in that societal sector, whether they're in prison themselves or whether it's the people who work inside prison, like the officers, are living for their either their entire existence or, you know, for eight hours a day at least in a place where there's no nature. And so my drive was to bring nature to them, to calm them, to connect them, and so forth. But, but I had a problem when I first started out and I sort of approached superintendents and approached wardens. And I said, I really wanna connect people with nature in, you know, in your prison. And they said, well, you know, this is a prison. This <laughs> isn't a recreational center and this isn't a ner plant nursery. This is a prison and our job, our mission is, to, is public safety, mm -hmm. public safety, public safety. So I had to be humble. I had to exert intellectual humility put aside what I hold as a value of connection to nature and think about how I could, so to speak, sell that or conform to the values that prison superintendents has had, or I would never get into a prison. So I started reading about like, what is it that prisons are supposed to do? What are the values that a prison superintendent has when he or she reports to the state legislature? Well, I learned that they have to keep recidivism as low as possible because it costs $40,000 a year to, to, to keep a prisoner inside a prison. And so that means if they can reduce the number of prisoners who or people who are incarcerated who come back, you know, that would be it. We also know that, that superintendents value post-release employment because that's a key to not having people come back to the prison. So I began thinking about ways of selling what we were trying to do, but in terms of the prison superintendent, not me. And so when I said, you know, we're gonna be teaching them job skills. They're gonna learn about coming, you know, being on time to be in this group that's sorting mosses. We're gonna learn, they're gonna learn about, you know, classify, classify things. Uh, and when they, they, the people who are raising frogs might be able to get a job at a zoo or at a nursery. And so I sort of sold it or couched it or framed it in terms of the kinds of things that would be valued by by prison superintendents. And when I started doing the nature imagery thing, I said, you know, at first I approached prison saying, you know, this will make your inmates feel better, feel calmer. And the officer said, we don't care about that. We know all our job is, is that they're in here and we have to look out for them so that they won't be violent. So then I was able to bring the literature that said, well, being exposed to nature reduces stress, reduces anxiety, reduces ang uh, aggression, and reduces violence. We've seen that in other sectors, in hospitals, in Alzheimer's uh, places. And so that was the evidence that I had to muster in order to become acceptable to enter into this prison to carry out conservation. And as it turned out, that's exactly what happened. I wasn't really able to get access when I used my own values. I was only able to get access when I was aware of and could conform to the values of the other sector. And so that's really tough to do when you're a scientist because when you're a scientist, you think, oh, science is so wonderful, everybody loves it. Or when you work with nature, well, of course, everybody loves it. But if your job is not about loving nature, I mean, it would be like if a prison superintendent came to me and said, hey, Nalini, could I give a talk in your ecology class about prisons? 
And I'd say like, what are you talking about? This is about ecology, it's not about corrections. So that's why when you think about approaching another sector, you always wanna put yourself in the mindset by reading their website, by reading the literature about their sector, by having some conversations with someone like, who, who might be open to having a conversation about what their world is like. And it is only by doing that, that you can gain access into these other sectors. In terms of support, um, the early work was unsupported, but it didn't take much because like the moss project that we had where we, we taught men how to grow or inmates how to grow mosses for so that we could reduce the collection of mosses from primary forests, selling them to the selling these mosses to the horticulture trade and to florists. Um, you know what we had to what what I it didn't take much money at all. I mean, it was my students and me collecting mosses, taking these, driving them these bags of mosses to this the small minimum security prison, and then just doing it. You know, it didn't take a bunch of money. But once we started to expand the program to the, the 12 state prisons in Washington State, they began to see the values of it. And actually, the Washington State Department of Corrections has supported that work um, with funds because they see the value of it in terms of preparing their inmates for the STEM workforce or for the positive sort of uh, uh, look that that it has or for the for the they've understood that this is an important thing. I was later approached in 2017 I was approached by the Utah State Board of Education. They had heard what we were doing with adults who were incarcerated and they said, you know, we have a population of youth in custody and we would really like to augment the science uh, the science education that they get could you do the same kinds of things for our youth in custody that you're doing for adults. And as it turned out, they provided us with a $1.2 million contract for five years to support the staff that would help bring science and conservation projects and, and researchers inside of juvenile detention centers. So my point is really the same thing, that when you start small and modestly, even if you don't have a great big fat NSF grant or a big grant from somebody, you can still start doing the work. And once you start doing it, you start getting results. You start getting media. You start, getting, you start writing papers about what you've done. And that then builds momentum that allows a big funding agency like the National Science Foundation to say, maybe there's something here about involving inmates and people who are incarcerated in the act of conservation and science education. That's wonderful. And there's a follow-up question on this by Dana Freeman, who would like to know about how prisoners uh, or those incarcerated receive those projects and were they eager to join? Um, were they initially less receptive or skeptical? And do you have any stories of, of how maybe someone got involved in science or yeah. did something from that work and took it beyond the project? Yeah, you know, I was terrified when I first went to the, not, I was, I mean, it's scary to think about going inside a prison, but I was terrified that not just going into a prison, but I was afraid that they would think I was dumb or, you know, like, who is this woman like who is this stupid professor who's coming in with these dumb plants like we don't want them you know we don't we don't want but it was the opposite ever since the first day that i walked into a prison with bags of mosses there was intense interest now all of this work is voluntary there's no people who are incarcerated in any of the prisons that we've worked at that we said you have to help raise these endangered frogs we it's all voluntary but there's a long waiting list because it seems like every single person who's incarcerated wants to work on these projects. And of course, I mean, yeah, like wouldn't you rather work on with frogs than you would, you know, wash or making license plates or washing the floor or something. So we always had more volunteers than we could. And the attitude about participating in conservation of interacting with people who are scientists and conservationists has been overwhelmingly positive. And there was a person, I'll, I'll just describe one person that I always think about with this. His name is Craig Ulrich. He was um, incarcerated in Washington state for six years. He was accused of man, oh, and he was convicted of manslaughter, but he really wanted to make the most of his time. And he said, when we first entered that prison, the Cedar Creek Correctional Center, he said, I'd really like to work on a project. So I, we had started a composting project um, with a kitchen waste that we were putting in for the gardens that we had created. And I said, here's a thermometer and a notebook and a pencil, Craig, just take, take the temperature of the compost every, you know, twice a day and record them. And, you know, maybe we'll find out something about the efficacy of, of composting with different food types. So he did, he was very assiduous. He was careful. He got more and more interested in what we were doing. And he said, 
do you think I could do more? And I said, well, well, let's write a paper. Let's write a paper for a peer reviewed journal. So he did, he wrote it out by hand. There are no computers. There's no internet access in these prisons. And so he would give the pages to the superintendent who would then give me those manuscript pages when I visited once a month. And we ended up writing a paper. He was first author on it. It was published in an, a peer reviewed ecological journal. And he went on to go to graduate school and he went on to become a professor at the University of Nevada in biology. Now that's one person, one, you know, one person who, who sort of took it all the way to joining academia. But you know, I don't think this project, I know that this project is, now, is not about producing PhDs out of people who are incarcerated. It's about exposing the joy and the inspiration and the stimulation that comes with working with any kind of scientific project. And it's about the sense of accomplishment and the sense of shifting to become a science learner that we've seen. It's about shifting to become a contributor to society instead of someone who does not contribute to society. And we have carried out formal evaluations with human subject research permission with pre and post science lecture surveys, with pre and post conservation project surveys. And what we have found is that, that the incarcerated people increase their science knowledge content. They shift their self-identity to be science learners and they express a desire to share what they've learned with other people, with their cellmates and their families. We've also carried out evaluations on the scientists. We just published an article in the journal Bioscience that came out in February, where we did surveys on the scientists who gave these lectures and, and ran these conservation projects. And we found that those folks stated, self-reported that they became better communicators, they became better teachers of people from diverse learning backgrounds, and they gained a sense of contribution, a sense of meaning to the research that they did, they do, that is in addition to the sense of meaning that they get when they contribute to the scientific record. And perhaps even more significant, I think, is that many of them became more aware of social justice issues. They said, and they shifted the way they thought about these incarcerated populations. They were surprised at how, what great questions they asked, what, what interests they showed. And many of them said, I'm gonna join Black Lives Matter. I'm gonna write to my congressman to increase funding for correctional education. And so what was so, to me so exciting and remarkable then is that this group of academics, over 350 scientists who have given lectures or run conservation projects, have shifted the way they think about themselves in terms of having a place in society that is more attuned to being socially just. And for an academic to really think that, to take an action, I think, by the simple act of one lecture in one prison is a remarkable thing. And I think we might learn from that and think about other ways that people who are in the ivory tower, they're isolated in their own bubble as people who are in the prison tower in their bubble. And if we can weave together those two sectors of society, I think we might find improvement for both the incarcerated and also the academics. That is such a, a wonderful image to think about how we can connect that and come out of the ivory tower as we're in academia for the, those of us who are on this webinar tonight. Um, and earlier in, in our series, Robin Wall Kimmerer um, presented and um, she talked to some students in my class about, a lot about decolonizing the field of ecology and how do we really understand different ways of knowledge, of knowing and knowledge of ecology. Um, I wonder if you could speak a little bit about your sort of thoughts on indigenous knowledge on ecology, traditional ecological knowledge, and that, that role in advancing science and ecology. And if, if you have any sort of projects in that area or thoughts or, or inspiration to share with us. Yeah, no, I really have to say, Tara, that I don't. I haven't worked closely with indigenous groups. Um, I've, I've observed from sort of afar this, this the wonderful development of the subfield of ecology, which we call traditional econo ecological knowledge or TEK. Um, people like Terry Chapin, for example, who, you know, in the past was like this amazing standard ecological ecosystem ecologist sort of realized that and he worked at the University of Alaska, realized how much knowledge indigenous people in his 
part of the country um, understand in terms of large mammal populations and migrations and so forth. And so he really, I think to me, he was one of the really significant sort of traditional ecological researchers who was able to, and I think this is about intellectual humility also, was able to say, well, I think I know a lot about wildlife ecology and I use, you know, GPS collars and I use big data and I use statistics and so forth. But he sort of stepped away from that and allowed himself to work with and live with to understand caribou and caribou migra migration in different ways than he had before. And it doesn't mean that academic science is meaningless or bad. I just think that it's about weaving another thread into that tapestry I was showing you, which is in addition to spiritual values and and, and aesthetic ways of knowing and so forth, that we could add another thread called indigenous ways of knowing that might mingle and enrich and make a, a more complete picture mm -hmm. emerge on that tapestry than what we in academia sort of are stuck with, so to speak, because we use this finite set of tools and approaches and ways of understanding. So I, I believe that Robin is, is completely correct as she always is in terms of you know, what she writes about, what she thinks about, what she communicates. But I don't think that, and I don't think that Robin would indicate, oh, we have to throw away academics or the Western way of knowing. I think she's advocating as Terry Chapin did that we can add these threads in, in order to enrich our understanding, enhance our understanding to make better decisions about difficult, complex, ecological, environmental, and social problems. Wonderful. Um, so we have a, a question from Heather Olins in biology who first comments, wonderful talk, and just that she'd love to hear about any efforts to rewild tropical areas and the extent to which canopy communities may be able to recover or not recover. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll give you one example of, um, of an ecological restoration project that I'm familiar with because it, it, it takes place in Monteverde, Costa Rica, where I've been doing my research for about 35 years. A woman named Deb Hamilton has started a reforestation project along the Pacific slopes of Costa Rica, which have been deforested for really centuries, you know, when, when cattle ranches were formed because of the, you know, when the Spaniards came over and they got these huge chunks of land from the crown, uh, they basically got deforested very rapidly. And those Pacific slopes are really um, important habitat for remarkable birds like the resplendent quetzal and the three wattled bellbird. And so there are particular trees that belong to the, um, uh, the avocado family uh, that Deb has planted in with the help of many volunteers, many student groups, both from the United States and locally in order to reforest those Pacific slopes. And what she has learned about what it takes to do that reforestation, the fact that fencing is very important, that the collaboration and cooperation of local farmers is essential. Um, those kinds of lessons I think are really, I think are really applicable to other tropical regions. And I think there's just a, a huge number of efforts that are going on right now to reforest. And there are also efforts, again, locally in Monteverde, the, um, the Monteverde um, Conservation League is a local conservation group. It's always struggling for funds, but it protects the Peñas Blancas Valley, which is one of the most beautiful and one of the most diverse areas in, in, in all of Central America. So when I go to visit Monteverde and go visit this cloud forest that's, that's preserved thanks to the efforts of biologists and conservationists and all the people who have contributed to it, I feel myself on that knife bridge, you know, leaning towards hope, not, not leaning all the way towards hope, but leaning those efforts of Deb Hamilton and of the Monteverde Conservation League to me represent extremely hopeful points. And I, I want to see those things replicated. I want to see those activities documented and spread so that, you know, undergraduate students at Boston College could say, hey, there is hope. I can go to Costa Rica, I could volunteer for the Monteverde Co Conservation League. I could go to Monteverde and I could volunteer for that reforestation project that Deb Hamilton started you know, 15 years ago. And so I wanna make sure that your students understand that we see these images, we, we read news stories of, of despair and those are correct, those are true. But there are also ways, there are projects and there are people that are going on right now that your students can participate in and use their remarkable energy and use their new insights, their new energy, their new social media tools um, you know, to push conservation efforts in ways that older people like myself and Deb Hamilton, you know, we can't even imagine might be possible. Mm 
And so that's why I'm looking to people like my nephew, Zach, because, because I think he's going to figure out ways that are going to be really helpful to these efforts. I, I know they will. That is such a great response. And I think connected to that question um, is another question about, I mean, you about how you maintain your strength and your perseverance in the face of opposition. And you strike me as someone who's so positive and uses engagement to, to maintain that positivity. Um, but do you, can you speak a little bit about when you do come across opposition and how you persevere through that? Yeah, that's a great those who are finding it really challenging, like a mountain to climb of, of opposition, yeah. <laughs> especially <with> climate change. <laughs> Yeah, uh, well, I have to say, you know, I, I know that I seem really upbeat and really happy and, and, and full of energy, um, but there are many times when I'm low and I'm sad and I'm full of despair and I, I see problems that I know I can't solve. And especially now where I am in my career, which is, you know, nearing the end of it, I'm worried, oh dear, what am I, what am I, how, what else can I do? And so I think it's this, I, I guess that's why I like this image of the knife edge of despair and hope, because I think we cannot ignore the despair, but we can also not let go of hope. And so for me, I think um, it is about engagement. It's about having a conversation with someone like Zach and seeing his enthusiasm when my enthusiasm flags, or it's like getting uh, some kind of a communication from one of the one of the people who are incarcerated that I worked with, you know, six years ago, who might send me a note and say, you know, I'm working for a nursery now, and I'm really grateful for what what I learned before, and so that keeps me going. So it's about communication, it's about engagement, not just to give people information about how many species of canopy epiphytes there are on a given tree in the Monteverde cloud forest. You know, that's just information. What really has to keep us going, I think, is is these interactions these interrelations. And for me, I get energized every time I go to a new sector, you know, when I talk to a new warden or I, I, I have a conversation like with the, you know, the minister of the St. Mark's Episcopal Cathedral, you know, where, where I map these trees. And, and he tells me, hey, you know, Nalini, we're thinking about solar panels for the cathedral. Do you know anybody who could help us put solar panels on our cathedral so that we can be carbon neutral by 2030? And I mean, this is, this is an Episcopalian minister who's thinking about climate change and what he and his church can do in downtown Salt Lake City, one of the most conservative cities and one of the most conservative states in the United States. So when I talk to Reverend Haldren, it's like, I am energized by that because it, it just gives me more hope because I'm finding these little flames in unexpected places, a church, a prison, a, a, you know, a, a urban youth, you know, people that that you think would not be interested, but they are, or a manicurist studio. Like, you know, when I was getting my fingernails painted, the, the Vietnamese woman who was painting them on said, oh, I love trees too. And she started telling me about the trees in her home village in Vietnam. And so we were suddenly having this combination, you know, this conversation that made me understand that even though I might think of her as this sort of faceless, nameless manicurist who just works in a some sort of nail sal salon, actually has the same feelings that I have about trees. And it just took a little conversation to sort of bring those out. So I, I guess what I would say is when you're feeling low or full of despair or feeling the darkness that comes of seeing images of fires in the Amazon or you know, a tree just suffering from the mega drought that we were having here for 20 years in the Intermountain West. I, I think it's important to make yourself have con contact with some conservation group or some like-minded person who may or may not be in your social group. It might be somebody entirely outside it. Don't assume that all the people that care about the environment are at a college like Boston College. And I love your approach of, of approaching people with that intellectual humility and trying to understand their values. Um, and I, I don't, can't imagine that you thought, you know, anything less of the manicurist. What I think is so fascinating about you, Nalini, is that you see the, the human spirit, the beauty in every person, and that every person has the potential to connect to nature and that we can't give up on people no matter if they are removed from nature. In fact, we have to dig in deeper to engage them right. and work even harder. Um, so I just find your message so compelling. 
Um, another question came up about um, how do we how do we gain ecological values through recreation? Um, and then also there was a question kind of connected to this about the value of exploring nature on your own for spiritual reasons or in community group. Um, mm -hmm. And should people view nature as a form of art, taking in the beauty by themselves and in silence, um, or kind of participate in these larger groups, which is something that you were doing, for example, bringing those those groups together. Like, right. could you speak a little bit about that value of being together versus separate and also recreation? Because you were climbing trees as a kid and right. maybe you were on your own up in the canopy or maybe you were playing chase with your sisters and brothers. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think this idea is not so much, is it this or that? I For myself, I'll just speak for myself my connection to nature is very often manifested, manifested in hiking and going out to somewhere wild. I'm really fortunate to be able to do that in Washington state, you know, where I used to live. And I just love the Cascade Mountains and the Olympics and all the nature there. And here I am in Utah. And similarly, we have access to different kinds of nature, you know, deserts and sage land and so forth. Um, and I enjoy both. I enjoy going out in groups. In Washington state, I'm part of a group of about like a hundred people who go on hikes. I mean, not all a hundred at the same time, but there's this group of people that I am a part of that enjoy and cherish the sharing of the physical part of hiking, but also the connection to nature that we get when we walk through the, 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 the forest. But I also love encountering nature by myself. And for the last 15 years or so, I always take a five or six day solo hike in the in the Pacific Northwest in the summer. So I go off by myself for six, seven days. You know, I have a backpack. I, I go very simply. I, I always choose a different place. And it doesn't actually matter where I go. I just need to get out. It usually takes two days for like my mind to just, you know, to stop thinking about what emails am I missing or what proposal do I have to work on? Or, you know, how's Jack doing? Or, you know, those sorts of thoughts take really two or three days to calm. And then I have two or three days of, I don't know, it's not an empty mind, it's just a mind, it's my mind. And it's it's about connecting with these trees. And I find that I don't, during those times, I don't like scribble down ideas for my next ecological research project. It just, I'm in a kind of a different mode for some reason. And, and when I emerge from that, I'm ready to come back to Jack and my kids and the family and so forth and my work. But it's like those six days reset something in me, put me in touch with something in me that I, I guess I really need. Because mostly my life is extremely busy and I'm always talking to people and interacting with students and staff and arranging things and starting projects and so forth. And so that little still point of, of the solo hike to me is something that is incredibly valuable. And I find I'm not afraid. I, I'm not afraid to go out alone. I, I can't think of anything that would hurt me out there. Um, and so it's it's a time of being without fear and without demands and obligations. And it's a time when I can just do what I want to do in the forest. And sometimes I hike 18 miles a day, you know, to get to a particular lake and back. And sometimes I just stay at the campsite and I just sit under a tree for like the whole day long. And it's so wonderful. And I really I recommend it to everybody, especially women. I think it's very important for women to do this. I don't know why, but I just feel it's important. So I think your question about, can we enjoy and connect with nature as groups? The answer is yes, and that's really wonderful. Can we enjoy and connect with nature as individuals? And the answer I believe is yes, and it's really wonderful. So I guess that's the way I would respond. And in terms of recreation, that question about recreation, I feel I recreate in the term recreate, like recreate. It's like recreate myself. And I think that is something significant. But then other times, you know, it's just fun. And I think we need fun. And I think if we associate fun and joy and celebration, whether alone or with a group with nature, that's another gift that we get from these ecosystems. And um, it's another motivation for conservation. You know, I think of scuba diving and I think of marine biology and I think of the world of people who skin dive and scuba dive and many of the efforts to create marine sanctuaries has been as a result of recreational divers because they want to protect 
what they enjoy hanging out in, you know, watching diverse fish and coral reefs and so forth. So I think recreation is actually can play a very important role in conservation because they are passionate about it, maybe for a different reason than the, somebody studying biodiversity of coral reefs, but it's the same outcome is let's protect these reefs because they are so important and because they meet the values that that we have, whether that's a recreational value, whether that's a biodiversity value, whether that's an economic value, it doesn't matter. That's what I've learned in, in entering these sectors is that I don't care whether religious people celebrate trees because God made them or whether they or whether biologists celebrate tree diversity because they're the process of millions of years of evolution. What we can agree on, what we can find common ground with, and I learned this giving these sermons, is that trees are valuable to us. And so let's get together to plant trees. Let's get together to raise money to save a, a forest reserve. Let's get together after services to take a walk in the hills and enjoy the gamble oaks that live up there. Let's take a walk to that fresh water wetland that, that's not very far from Boston College. Let's do that because we value it. And that's, you know, that's the whole thing is it doesn't matter why you value it or what the values are it's just that we value it that's important well that is such a beautiful note to end on and i want to thank you nalini for coming to boston college and giving this fabulous talk also talking with our students in two other classes prior to okay. this um it's just been such a pleasure to hear your thoughts and to feel inspired by the great work that you're doing because i know that everyone who is on tonight will go off and make some change in their life, whether it's talking to that person every week um, or painting their nails yeah. or looking into connecting to something bigger, a bigger project. Um, it's just been really wonderful to, to have you here with us tonight. So thank, thank you, so, you much. so much. And thanks to Boston College and all your sponsors um, for making this whole series, this rewilding series possible. Yes. Thanks so much. Thank you. And with that, I'm going to say good night to everyone. Um, have a good one. And please uh, stay in touch with our Rewilding Planet Earth series. It is not over. There's more to become. <laughs> Take care. Good night. Bye-bye. <laughs>